Please open your Bibles with me to James chapter 3 and reading from verses 1 to 12. James chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is God's word. Oh, good evening, everyone. It's nice to be back here at Castle Hill. I was here a few months ago. We were doing a series in James at Pennant Hills. And just oh, the message I shared last time challenged me, so I thought I'd share it with you. And it was about the use of the tongue and uh, the words we use. Now, at Penno, we've gone back and done a series in Mark, and then we've, I've gone back to the second half of James. And it just so happens I did a talk on the tongue. And uh, so I'm not hammering you about that, but it just feels fitting. And if you like, it is a bit of a series of consistency for those of you who were here a few months ago. Um, Whoops. There we go. Watch your tongue. That's what we're talking about tonight. Tom's already prayed, but I'm going to pray because I like to uh, get God's help. Father, we need your help because, boy, we've got tongues that run out of control and I'm using my tongue to teach your word and that is a weighty responsibility. So give people discerning minds, give us soft hearts, but Lord, work in amongst us by your spirit that we might hear your word and obey. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. James, it's, it's really about practical Christian living, uh, wisdom as followers of Jesus. And those first two chapters really have almost a theme, I think, of faith works. Firstly, faith works because faith actually, it works, it has good outcomes. Putting your faith in Jesus makes life better. Really it does. It doesn't make it easy, but it makes it better in so many ways. But faith works in the sense that also it has an outworking. If you have faith in Jesus, you will be doing works. A little silly little song borrowed from, uh, I think it's Frank Sinatra, Faith and Works, Faith and Works, go together like a knife and forks. So that's my little rhyme. Let me tell you, brother, you can't have one without the other, a bit like love and marriage. So having made, though, the point that faith works, the first thing that James mentions as he moves on from the really the, when he most emphasizes that most strongly in chapter 2, the first thing that he mentions, the outworking of this, perhaps the litmus test, is that we examine the words that come forth from our mouth. 
And James has already had a lot to say about this. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And I spoke on that last time, but just over in verse 26, a little further on. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves. And their religion is worthless. Their faith is not working as it should if you don't keep a tight rein on your tongue. Well, we get to chapter 3 and now James has not just a verse here and a verse there, but an extended discourse on this same topic. And the first thing he says, he doesn't say it directly, but it's implied is that the tongue, i.e. words, are absolutely essential. In other words, they are hugely beneficial for the Christian life, for the wise life, for, let's face it, all of life. Communication with words, that is language, is I think more than anything what sets human beings apart from the animals. It makes us God-like because with language, with speech, we form propositions. And with propositions, we pile them up to create understanding. With understanding, it allows for the tra transmission of knowledge, the sharing of of thoughts, the building of intimate relationships by even the building of skyscrapers because of language. That is godlike to even be express creative things in words because our God is not, a, is not some amorphous oomph of the cosmos. Our God is a personal God who has spoken God has made himself known in words, propositionally, so he can be known personally. His heart, his intentions, his character. And we, as followers of Jesus, want everyone to know our God and his ways. So in our churches, it's essential for us to teach the scriptures, his word. So that people can know the very nature of the one true God. So we can grow together in our knowledge and our love for God. Words are so important. And therefore to be called upon by other Christians, by a family of believers, to teach these wonderful truths, these words of God, is such a rich privilege and such a, let's face it, heavy responsibility. Because words matter and therefore the tongue matters and it's absolutely essential. So James gives this warning. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers. Because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. What a weighty burden to teach the things of God. You cannot be loose about such things. You cannot be flippant. Rather, you need to be obedient and even more importantly, importantly, to live a life that is consistent, that is in conformity with what you're teaching. What a heavy responsibility. So James says, don't be in a rush to do that. Don't be motivated by the honour and the authority that naturally comes with the position that I'm currently standing in. Because you have a judgment to face. If you are not faithful, if you are loose in your words when you teach about God, if you make it actually not about the word of God, but all about you or your issues. So in our churches, we need teachers who are humble. Humble before themselves, humble before God, humble before others. And it's a great danger to think that you are God's gift to the church. What we need is instead teachers of radical humility because we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. You get your tongue right, you'll get everything else right, trust me. The tongue is vital 
and words are essential for Christian ministry. So it's a great responsibility and a great necessity to have people teaching the scriptures. But let me tell you, I struggle. And I'm sure that your pastor Ian struggles. And I'm sure that your best online preacher struggles. And if they say they don't, they are a liar. We all struggle to control our tongue. Because the evil spills out from within and the very first muscle it hits is that little wet thing in your mouth, the tongue. So careful, careful, careful. If you want to be a teacher of the word. And as a church, pray that you are taught by humble servants. Those who recognize their place under a good and wise king. Those who are not loose or carefree as they proclaim to you the word of God the goodness of his kingdom. Now, of course, we do want to encourage people to do that. The scriptures tell us that we should. Uh, for indeed, to be a pastor or a teacher in God's church is a noble task. It's a good work. And it's good to aspire to that. But do so. If you fear that is you, only ever do so with a reverent fear. Because you are handling the very words of God. A truth that give life. Watch your tongue. So James then moves on from addressing teachers to, well, really everyone else in the church. Because the tongue, small though it may be, well, it's in constant use and it's incredibly powerful. He illustrates it quite simply. When you put bits into the mouth of horses to, take them, to make them obey us, we can, we can turn the whole animal or to take ships as an example. Although, although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants it to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. boasts. A horse, strong and spirited, is incredibly powerful and yet it's controlled by this little bit of metal in its mouth. Incredible. A ship battered by the wind and the waves. If you've ever been in the wind and the waves, you know how much they can batter them. And yet with a bit of power, it's controlled just by a tiny little rudder. Amazing. And our bodies, all oh, 70, I wish it was less or slightly, just a little bit, 78 kilos or 76 kilos, whatever it is at the moment, has a tongue that weighs, what, 100 grams? 200 grams? And one word can shape the whole course of a day. Indeed, a whole week. One word can shape a whole lifetime. So powerful. Do we control our tongues or do our tongues control us? Are we harnessing the incredible power of the tongue or letting the power of the tongue harness our lives? Who's in control? You see, words are powerful. Words can change the world. Nazi Germany, the Third Reich, the Holocaust, terrible, terrible deeds began with words. And the abolition of slavery and the sacrifice of many began with words. And you know your life, the words that have had a lasting, deep impact to make wounds that take a long time to recover. And you know in your own life the words that have encouraged you to sacrifice official service and love and honour. Words are so powerful. They come from the tongue. And as with anything very powerful, we must weigh the reality that the tongue let to run out of control, is seriously dangerous. Watch the havoc it can wreak.
James puts it like this. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Great boasts. That's never a good start. And the tongue is very good at it. What to boast of? Or power and destruction? It's like I was the arsonist that started the bushfire. Good on you. You fool. Vicious conflict. Distrust. Disunity. Breakdown. Pain and loss begins with words. Often one simple word. And just as with bushfires, we had bushfires, I think it was the start of 2020, end of 2019, really bad ones. I was up at Mount Victoria not long after, it was terrible. I bet if I go up to Mount Victoria now, there's healing taking place. But I tell you what, it wasn't like it was in 2019. You can see that there's been a massive bushfire through there. It takes years sometimes to heal. So easy to start. Even more graphic, the tongue is also a fire. A world of evil amongst the, part of the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Gee, he doesn't mince his words, does he? Evil thoughts and intentions and desires rise up from within and they hit that little muscle behind our lips and we become like fire-breathing dragons. We go. And if you're in the way, I don't care. It corrupts the whole body. We become scorched all over. In fact, James says, the whole wheel of our existence is set on fire by hell. The devil's behind our tongue, this fire, when we do these things. This is seriously dangerous stuff. Back in verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who has never at fault in what they say is perfect. This is your problem. None of us are perfect. Not even close. Who can control their tongue? Who does control their tongue? We're all like these fire-breathing dragons. And you wonder why there's so many fires in your life. Why is it so hot in the kitchen? Watch your tongue. See if it doesn't calm things down. Do you have a gas bottle at home, you know, for the barbecue? I do. We keep it in the garage. Uh, I was using the barbecue a year or so two ago and one of the O-rings had a crack in it and I could tell the gas was leaking out. We didn't barbecue that night until I got the O-ring replaced because that's smart, yeah? But gas is good. We use it for cooking and for heating and maybe sometimes for lighting. But it's also incredibly powerful. And therefore it is seriously dangerous so we need to treat the gas with respect, even with fear. Because gas explosions, they're deadly. We do the same with petrol, don't don't we? Do you, it says don't use your mobile phone while you're filling up petrol. How are you? You're at the petrol station. You see someone smoking. You're feeling happy? It's deadly, so we take care. And we use our tongue so glibly. I'm just going to say what I want to say. And we think that everybody's profiting because we're so clever. 
and our insights are so powerful. And off we go. Blah, 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 lies, slander, insult, deceit, pride, boasting. Why is everybody upset? Our default is glib disrespect for the power of the tongue. I just want to speak my mind. I just want to let people know what I'm thinking. We've got no respect for this very dangerous implement. Would you do that with a gas bottle? Let's go get the gas bottle from the garage. Let's go to the lounge room. Anybody want to smoke? Let's just splash the petrol around. We don't even do that with knives. We treat them with more respect. Yet when we open our mouths, we're playing with fire. So we need to foster a rightful fear. And take precautions. We need to go slow. What did James say? Everyone should be quick to listen, and slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We, we need to set limits. This is what you do with safety. We need to force ourselves to adopt safe practices so that we can control the power. Has anyone mastered their tongue? Does anyone treat it with the reverent fear that it deserves? Well, I'll let you know, I've actually been trying. In our church recently, we've had this program called 40 Days of Prayer. And part of that was every day. We have these everyday prayers. So for 40 days, there's other prayers. But every day, I'm going to pray these prayers. Three ashes for growth in godliness. One of the ones that I wrote down, when we did it, we finished about two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. I wrote down for 40 days, I want to pray for, grow, watch my tongue, will control my tongue. And so for 40 days, every morning, I was praying, Lord, help me to control my tongue. And every day when I prayed that prayer, I'd think about the day before and I would go, oh my goodness me. I can't believe it. You think you'd pray every single day. There'd be something, you know, okay, Lord, I got through that one, all right. How about today? We'll be great, great again today. Lord, forgive me. Why is it so hard to control this one little muscle? <laughs> Don't we realize how much damage it's causing when we just let it go unrestrained? Is, is our, are our tongues a lost cause? Oh, perhaps so. All kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed. And have been tamed by mankind. It's amazing what we can do. But no human being can tame the tongue. Your tongue is a restless evil. Your tongue is full of deadly poison. Here's the irony. This is my truth. I bet it, maybe it's not your truth. You can correct me. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father. And with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursings. My brothers and sisters, this, this, this should not be so. Oh, we've been singing God's praises today. I hope that was encouraging for you. It was encouraging for me. It's good. It's right. It's fitting. It's one of the reasons God gave us language and tongues and words that we might declare propositionally and even emotionally his glory. And yet before, well, the day is done. This is better than preaching this in the morning, but I reckon it's still going to be true. Before the day is done, how are you going to go? You've been singing his praises tonight. Do you reckon you can keep it till midnight? It should not be so. But it's constantly the case. Can both fresh water and salt water come from the same spring? Praising curses? The lies of the devil? The fire of the devil and the praises of God? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? This is a teaching of Jesus. Or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt water spring produce fresh water. 
It's a worry, isn't it? Perhaps we should just give up and let the fire spread. That's the way we are. Let the poison kill. Oh, who, who wants? We, we can't afford that, can we? This is a serious problem we have with our tongues. And you know the root problem? James is talking about the tongue here. It's all about the tongue. But you know what? The problem goes much deeper. It's not the tongue that conceives the evil that it speaks or concocts the poison that it ejects. Here's our Lord's teaching. What goes into someone's mouth is not what defiles them, but it's what comes out of their mouth that defiles them. That's what James is saying, particularly the tongue. But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. And these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander, the list could go on. The tongue is just a mirror of our heart and its condition. Jesus was um, approached by Pharisees who were accusing him of doing the work of the devil. Well, you know, our Lord pulled no punches. He used his tongue forcefully to speak the truth. And he said this, Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. The heart, the words, make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognised by its fruit. That's what James was teaching us. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Here's our real problem. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Oh gosh, our tongues really are a mirror and it's not a pretty sight. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Oh Lord, for by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. Says Jesus of Nazareth, our Christ, our Lord. A good heart has pure words. It comes forth like a spring of fresh water that gives life. An evil heart spews forth deadly words like poison, like a spark for a bushfire. Is the tongue then a lost cause. Is there any way for us forward? Well, I believe so. It gets back, I believe, to that basic Christian formula, the most basic Christian formula, repentance and faith. What do we do with our tongues? Repentance and faith. First, repent. Repent. Will you, will I recognize the truth of what James says? This is not a word for someone else. It's very easy to make this a word for someone else. But that's not repentance. That's not helping you. Get some fire out of your life. Own this personally. I have a problem. I have a fire in my mouth. My words cause great damage. I need to be more careful. I need to set restraints. I need to be more aware. Repent. Lord, I want to turn from this. And as I turn from it, I recognize I can't fix this on my own. I need help, Lord. And so we come to faith. I can't do it in my own strength. And so we take the problem with our tongue to the Lord and we lay it before him and we even consecrate our words and our speech and our tongue in faith before Jesus and ask God that by his spirit he will change us from the inside out. Because if you don't have Jesus, you're left with an untamable tongue that is a wild 
and restful, restless evil full of deadly poison. The good news of the gospel is that tongue's not untamable by the Spirit of God. If you will repent and turn to him in faith and let him begin his slow and steady work of sanctification. Boy, we need Jesus. Boy, we need the gospel. This message of James on the tongue just drives us to the cross, doesn't it? We need God's indwelling, refining work to cleanse us by new birth to start from the inside. Give us a pure, clean heart and let it work out. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing, I think, when God does that. And I think God does do that. I'm always impressed by faithful older Christians. I've said it before, I'm not often that impressed by faithful young Christians, young people. God does a work by his spirit. It's incredibly powerful. It's an odd power. It's an otherworldly power when you can control your tongue. Well, as you know, the Queen's body was laid to rest this week. I'm sure many of you watched the funeral. I believe it, I happened to, but I've, I expected it to be powerful, and many people have told me it was quite a powerful Christian testimony. The Baptist Association, when the Queen passed, put out a statement. Baptist churches of New South Wales and ACT acknowledge the significance of Queen Elizabeth II's passing today. We join with people across the world in recognising her outstanding life of devoted service and public leadership. We reflect on her integrity, humility and her faithfulness in her calling. We also acknowledge her faith expressed in her own words and there's many quotes they could have taken but they took this one. Jesus Christ lived obscurely for most of his life and yet billions of people now follow his teaching and find him the guiding light of their lives. I am one of them. If you ever watched the Christ Queen's Christmas message, you'll know that she bore testimony to her faith every single Christmas, at least when I watched it. I think that was well stated, that statement. But you know, I, you know what I think of the most powerful thing of her entire life? of her reign, the thing that bore testimony to incredible strength and character that people have been making mention of for now over two weeks, in public, Queen Elizabeth II watched her tongue. She was incredibly disciplined in her speech. She represented the kingdom she didn't get involved in party politics. She didn't slander, slur or beseech anyone. She controlled her tongue. And she was dignified and steadfast and well loved as she fulfilled her responsibilities with remarkable courage and purpose. And the bit that we saw and that billions of others saw was a woman who controlled her tongue. And I am sure that this capacity was spurred on by the Spirit of God at work within her. And in that sense, I do fear a little bit for the future. She left a remarkable legacy, an incredible power, because I watch my tongue. We also represent a kingdom. And more than anything else, we're so often measured. People assess the value of our kingdom by how we handle our tongues. Because what we say mirrors our heart and therefore bears witness to the values we profess and we say we're followers of Jesus, the King. We need transformation. Your tongue is not a lost cause, neither is mine. And maybe today, if there are too many spot fires in your life, maybe today is a good day for repentance and faith. Repentance and faith, Lord, I'm a singer, sinner. Lord, I need help. 
So I'm going to keep trusting Jesus and ask you to change me. Amen.